welcome to a new episode of Raya Affairs and our special series, Climate Leaders 101. In case you haven't heard the first of the few episodes that we've already released ahead of COP27, this series contains an analysis into climate leaders that will range from countries and regions across the world. But before I go any further into this partnership, I wanted to introduce the co-host for this episode. So joining me today is Sylvia. You've probably already heard her if you've been following the podcast. She is an intern at Raya and an international relations and law bachelor student from Spain. Hi, Sylvia. Would you mind telling our listeners what Raya is all about? Hi, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of Raya Affairs. As always, to give you all a brief overview, Raya is an international think tank led by young professionals that translates the abstract world of international affairs by simplifying rather than generalizing. Raya is where you can learn about the stories and worries of political leaders, the behind the scenes of decision makers, and how politics impacts and changes your life. This is Raya Affairs, filling you in wherever you are. Thank you, Sylvia. So as part of standard procedure, it's important that everyone listening is aware of why we're pursuing the Climate Leaders 101 series on this podcast. So over the next following weeks, we're dedicating our episodes to climate leaders in a collaboration with RIA, IE University's School of Global and Public Affairs, and Ayuda en Acción, under the bigger and wider umbrella of what is the EU's commission initiative, One Planet for All. One Planet for All is a project that seeks to promote participation from European youth in the fight against climate change. And that's why we're here. Over the summer break, six IE students underwent 10 weeks of RIA training, just familiarizing themselves with the RIA methodology and attending other research-related seminars. Their final reports are being published on the RIA website as we speak. As always, we would like to make it clear that any expressed opinions in this episode are very much welcome, but they are not a direct reflection of RIA, as RIA specializes in unbiased writing and analysis of international affairs. And last thing, if you missed the episode um, that we released last week, we invited Raya summer intern Martina Volman to discuss Ali Ahmed of Ethiopia. Um, we discussed the prime minister's motivations, his philosophy and climate projects, as well as how this leadership connects to the ongoing Tigray war. So these are all topics that we've tackled But Martina's main message, of which was the most interesting, was that we should have a flexible understanding of environmentalism, taking a step back from a Western-centric understanding. So make sure to give it a listen. This week, we will be discussing another political leader. From Ethiopia, we're going north to Germany to discuss one of the most famous politicians there, Annalena Baerbock, belonging to the Green Party and leading them to the most significant positions since their beginning. Jenny Nash is the Turkish Raya Sarantern and writer put in San to discuss Baerbock stakes and policies at a domestic, regional and international level of analysis. Marina, on to you. All right. So hi, Putin, and welcome to Raya Affairs. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we begin, we want a little background on you. So why don't you tell us where you're from, what do you do, and why you were interested in joining the Raya and Summer IE I. Summer Program. Hi, Marina, Silvia. Thank you so much for having me. I am from Turkey, and currently I do a dual degree at IE University studying international relations and business. One of the main reasons I was interested to join the summer program was how connected the research was. And it wasn't only about learning about climate action, but the environment in which people are trying to make the climate action possible. This gave me just a bigger perspective of climate action truly is beneath the iceberg. And it was more of a aha moment where you understand how the mechanics of a system work. Thank you, Putin. Those motivations are very clear. And it's great to hear that that's why you've joined the summer program with Raya. Now, this next question, quickly, before we move on, we ask to all our guests, because we know that they're passionate about IR, but we also like to hear what they come up with. So, Puren, what leader, dead or alive, who has impacted the world, would you like the opportunity to have a conversation with, if you could? I have to say Mustafa Kemal Ataturk to this question, the founder of Turkish Republic. And aside from the sentimental importance his works has for me, 
I know he was a great visionary. His teachings and values were not only ahead of his time then, but it is needed now. And from education to state and global affairs, I feel like we are yet to fully comprehend how truly important his pre precepts and philosophies are. And then again, when I think about it, there's a great quote from him, which he addresses to the next generation of Turkish youth. And it goes, whenever you desire to see me, look into the mirror. For you, the Turkish youth are a part of me as I am yours. And that just completely encapsulates how important it is. That's such a beautiful answer, Putin. All right, let's begin, right? Uh, Putin, although some people might know Annalena Barbock being an influential, particularly in Germany, uh, she is not as known internationally as, let's say, Angela Merkel. Based on your research, who is Annalena Barbock? What is she known for? And how did her interest in environmental politics progress throughout her life? From the get-go, I want to say that based on my research, Annalena Baerbock is a pioneering political and climate leader because of her political stance. She is the first foreign minister to name global warming as her central policy issue and pledge to put international climate policies front and center. So as a politician and a foreign minister, this is quite revolutionary to me. I would, however, say she's primarily renowned for two of her accomplishments, domestically by making the Green Party enter federal government with her counterpart, Robert Habeck, when they became the co-leaders of the Green Party in 2018, after the Green Party being sidelined for 16 years. So that is quite an accomplishment in domestic area, regionally and internationally, by becoming the first female foreign minister of Germany. And... When making the comparison with, say, Merkel, we have to keep in mind that before retiring, Merkel served for 16 years with brilliant leadership. However, we are now witnessing the beginning beginning chapter of Baerbock's political career. So maybe you can ask me in 15 years and then we can compare. So for Baerbock's environmental politics has ever been consistent in her life. One of my favorite quotes from her is how she remembers her childhood. She says, police's water cannon from the anti-war and nuclear protests organized by the Green Party and the cakes eaten as a family at home afterwards. Throughout her upbringing, Baerbock grew up in a household that even though as civilians participated in environmental politics and the Green Party was formed out of civil society's desire to participate in politics and bring environment to the table of discussion. So this is only fitting to me that her interest only grew throughout the years and she kicked off her political career by being the co-leader of the Green Party. That's very interesting, Putin, because I was just going to ask you if you could give us a bit of information about Baerbock's upbringing in terms of family and education and how this has, and I quote from your report, shaped her values and political ideas, which later turned into her political stance and central policies. In the simplest form, Babok has two central political stances. One is the importance of having a radical nature when it comes to climate action. Second is the importance of collaboration and togetherness while doing so. So with this in mind, I want you to remember the quote I just said about how Babok remembers of childhood, political protests for climate action, and the cakes eaten as a family. This is one of the reasons why I love that quote, because it explains the essence or what Baerbock stands for politically and from a climate perspective. Now, Baerbock grew up in a rather large family with her parents, two sisters, and two cousins in the same household. And many people who grow up in a big family understands the importance of collaboration and unity to have harmony in that household. In the bigger picture, this is how we operate at international scale. We have many different bodies, organizations, unions, trying to accomplish goals. And without the sense of that collaboration and togetherness, the process becomes chaotic. So the importance of true and functional collaboration has been embedded to Baerbock ever since her upbringing, which reflects to her policies. I remember reading an interview of Baerbock's where she is asked what is the source of her dedication, and she holds up a stick figure drawing of her family. Understanding how important family values to Baerbock is how we realize the importance of the protests organized by the Greens she attended with her family as a child. When you grow up embracing the values of your family, it reflects your ideologies. 
Baerbock was born at the year that the Korean party was established. So she grew up in an environment where it was visible what the civil society could do in terms of politics and change when acted radically. All of this is why I said her upbringing has shaped her values and political ideas. So, Buren, when you were analyzing Annalena Baerbock's stakes, you discussed how her ideological outlook consists of three main points and that her policies and actions are oriented towards raising awareness of the need for an interconnected fight towards climate change. Could you go into detail about these three points? The three central points I identified were, first, climate action is not a singular issue. It is a collective issue and has the solutions, not only environmental problems, but to numerous international matters, such as security, food crisis, and even terrorism, as Baerbock emphasizes. And because of that interconnected nature, it mustn't be only seen as an environmental fight, but a collective international matter. The most current example would be the EU's dependency on fossil fuels, where an obstacle for climate neutrality calls and the no net green greenhouse gas emissions. And with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and cutting the gas supply to Europe, however, it also became a security issue for many countries and the bloc. This is one of the most visible examples I can say why Baerbock advocates understanding the interconnected nature of climate action is crucial to solve international matters and why climate action policies need more importance than ever before to solve such issues before they became major concerns. The second part is climate protection requiring radical action. I will continue from the same example again. In 2018, Baerbock made a candidacy speech to become the co-leader of the Green Party. In that same speech, she, sh she said, we must fight to accelerate the exit from coal power or it will be too late later. Had the coal exit had been prioritized before and was already done with an alternative energy source that meets the energy demand, during the current energy crisis, the nuclear power would have only been the only energy vacuum that needs filling. So if the process was taken beforehand, that radical action was taken beforehand, the security of energy issue would have been decreased now. However, now coal power plants extended use is a price that we all need to be paying. So the third point also correlates with why the coal plants need to lo run longer given the status quo. According to Baerbock, good policy making requires acknowledging the reality as it is to change it for the better, which means we cannot be idealistic about the current situation or whether it can be made better or not. This is a scenario that encountered a lot in politics to narrate a better storytelling to shift the public opinion. However, Baerbock acknowledges the downside of this, which is bad policy making because the policies being made are not suitable with the reality. So when the policy is done, it doesn't work or fit with the current affairs. This is one of the reasons why Baerbock recognized why the coal power plants have to run longer than planned and why this is the price of the Russia's invasion. Yes, she advocates for radical change, but not at the expense of reality or citizens, which is why she's pushing for giving importance to new renewable energy infrastructures that can replace the coal power in the near future. Perfect, Putin. We're actually going to get into some of the points you mentioned there later on with some of our questions. But now, as you've learned in the Raya methodology of analysis, there's a pivotal moment in an individual's career that initiates, or that's, that's a stronger indication, right, of their journey as climate action oriented, and which really changes their, their direction when it comes to deciding these climate policies. What would you say was Annalena Baerbock's defining moment, if you had to sum it up? I have to say it's her candidacy speech done in 2018 to, became, to become the co-leader of the Green Party. All right. And so as a follow-up, I actually read what you wrote about that speech, and I thought it was very interesting how you linked the impact of her 2018 candidacy speech to this defining moment that you've just stated. In the speech, she emphasized the need for radical change, which is the second point you had previously mentioned, Right. So radical change in the way that climate policies are made. And I would assume that the average voter or the average citizen would be very scared or scared away and critical of such radical proposals, especially because of the skepticism that surrounds climate change and because of the unpopularity of green parties in a number of countries. 
However, in what ways did Baerbock's speech have the opposite effect and actually inspire both party members and the public? One of the reasons that Baerbock's speech had the opposite effect was because in her speech, she acknowledged the criticism that green policies tend to have. They tend to put too much pressure to the citizens. And as a middle or upper class person, the sacrifice is doable. But for the middle, lower or lower classes, the sacrifice can take away from their livelihood. This makes the green policies nicer in theory than in practice. Baerbock showcased her understanding of this imbalance in her speech by acknowledging what green policies mean to lower classes and why they need a socio-economic approach when implementing. This was a different approach taken. She assigned the accountability of why green policies are being stagnant to the government and promised that whilst implementing such policies under her leadership, the government will support the citizen when green policies created socio-economic inequalities. That is very interesting point. Um, and Elena Barbrook has been quite assertive about the fact that climate issue is multidimensional, hence requiring the interconnected approach on the side of ministries at the domestic level. Could you elaborate on a current domestic aim that Barbrook has in terms of Germany's coal phase out? Currently, Baerbock is less involved in domestic goals since she has moved to the foreign ministry. However, as she did move, she also moved the international climate policy to foreign ministry from the environment ministry, which showcases how she believes climate policy must be dealt on international level to succeed, even though it is for domestic affairs. More specific to coal phase out, Germany has recently created an offshore wind energy hub with Denmark. So this was a project Baerbock has been advocating for to replace coal dependency with renewable energy. And according to Baerbock, the hub has potential to create twice as much electricity than Germany's coal power plants. All right, so this phase out actually reaches the German people at a social level too, as any transition towards renewables can increase the price of energy and can also affect people's employment status. And as said by Sylvia, Baerbock has prioritized the interconnectedness of these effects and really adapted um, and adopted strong social policy to accompany Germany's transition. So what factors has the Green Party really taken into account when measuring the impact of climate actions on citizens' lives? Um, in other words, what initiatives have they promised citizens? When Baerbock was running for chancellery, her party made sure when the green policies were advocated, the citizens wouldn't be paying for the cost of them. So the main categories I can tell you that was promised to protect citizens and yet bring about change were First, supporting employers and businesses by converting unemployment insurance into employment insurance. This was to necessitate the development of short-term work and strengthen the collective bargaining and co-determination. Meanwhile, the focus of businesses would be broadened to enable investments to increase a climate-friendly manner, particularly in the wake of the corona crisis. Secondly, climate protection agreements and European climate tariffs were promised, such as an investment program that calls for additional investments in climate neutrality, digitization, and infrastructure totaling 500 billion euros over 10 years to protect and assist the industry's reorganization. Thirdly, tightening the rental price break was initiated to ensure tenants wouldn't pay the cost of energy saving renovation and the CO2 price for heating while increasing the federal funding for the construction of social housing permanently. And last but not least, introduction of a mix of incentives and funding as well as regulatory law and CO2 pricing was in works to ensure social fairness of climate protection in everyday life while making this economic sense. So even though Baerbock hasn't won the chancellery, it is still important to note that throughout the coalition, through the coalition, the policies they advocated for during running for chancellery made it into the coalition argument. So even though Baerbock moved to the foreign ministry, her policies and initiatives continue to impact the domestic aff affairs just because they're in the coalition agreement. Thanks, Bruin. In your report, you state that Barbrook has advocated for a green transformation, not only at domestic, but at a regional level, especially concerning the EU approach. What is an example of a regional policy that Barbrook has undertaken 
and how has it progressed? One important approach Baerbock has concerning green transformation and the EU is advocating to increase renewable energies to decrease fossil fuel dependency. So with Germany assuming the presidency of the Baltic Sea Council early this July, Baerbock initiated to increase offshore wind energy to offset both Russian gas and fossil fuel dependency. The project not only helps Germany domestically, but also presents the EU an alternative energy source in the face of the current energy crisis. So we see that Baerbock's approach to employ renewable energy has progressed in two ways. One, it generates alternative and green sources of energy in the wake of the energy crisis in the EU. Second, it helps strengthen the EU's energy security while enabling green transformation. Um, thank you, Puren. So as we are coming to the end of this specific segment, it's very important to assess Baerbock's impact as a leader. You've just told us, right, that she's taken a very proactive approach to um, the EU's energy security and uh, also the uh, energy alternatives. But we want to begin with the domestic level. It goes without saying that Baerbock's attempt to leave Germany's most important source of power, coal, behind does not come without opposition and criticism. So what limitations exist regarding this particular uh, solution that Baerbock has proposed? What limitations exist on this impact that she intends to create? One of the biggest limitations were the simultaneous exit from both nuclear and coal power, two of which were considerable power sources for Germany and the bloc. Secondarily, the absence of an alternative energy source was another. Renewable energies are increasingly, increasingly significant, that is true. However, they are yet to become a match when it comes to the amount the fossil fuels can supply. And with the current energy crisis, this lack of alternative energy source created more opposition to simultaneous exit from coal and nuclear. Even though the renewable energy, especially wind energy production, increased considerably in Germany over the years, it alone is still not enough to meet the demand. Thank you, Purin. Um, originally and internationally, how much of an impact has Germany had with regards to the climate cooperation, would you say? Germany's goal of simultaneous exit from coal and nuclear by 2030, as ambitious as it was, had practical solutions as to how it can be achieved, which is a considerable impact on the positive side. Coal exit is particularly important for climate corporations to reach its goals, since the second coal power plant that produces the most CO2 emission is located in Germany. Regionally and internationally, Germany sustained and it continues to sustain climate cooperation with numerous partners, from the EU to China, and they share common values. One impact that is controversial, I have to say, and include, is it's not no nuclear approach that neither Baerbock nor the Green Party compromises. This results in a different kind of impact of Germany brings to the table, which is the pursuit of alternative sources of power that is not nuclear, but still is green. Thank you very much, Putin. We have finished the questions about your insightful report. Now I want your opinion on a very important note. Point blank, yes or no? Do you consider Annalena Barbuck to be a climate leader? Yes. Can you develop a bit on why? Oh, just, okay, point blank, yes or no. Okay, I thought it was just a yes. Um, I do consider her to become a climate leader because in the current state of affairs, I believe it takes a lot to say I am a foreign minister in a very important country and my central policy issue is global warming. And to make people aware that I don't say this because we have to act on climate alone, because she also says the climate crisis are the biggest crisis that we're facing right now because of how interconnected it is. And to make people understand, to make politicians understand why we have to prioritize climate action to solve international affairs is a very new approach and it changes the narrative what climate action is it's not just about making the environment safer making the environment better for the future generations but it is also making it safer for the current ones by solving many issues of energy security as we're facing now to terrorism to international development and it's just this this kind 
of approach is revolutionary as we're seeing it right now. So this is the reason why I would say point black. She is not only a climate leader, but she's a pioneering climate leader. Our aim in this short segment is to connect the dots of, of our climate leader at hand with wider international relations topics. So development, human rights, foreign policy, security, among others. Again, we're here to just show how um, connected global politics is with our leader at hand. Indeed, we can perhaps touch upon a big event that has affected all corners and politics of the world during these last few months and which had quite terrible developments yesterday as we were recording this podcast, which is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Apart from the impactful social consequences of the current war, there are important economic and, of course, political ramifications of the conflict. In terms of Germany and the green energy transition, the use of natural gas uh, was seen as a bridge of transition after the desired yet ambitious uh, simultaneous exit of the coal exploitation and nuclear energy use. Yet, the conflict prone display uh, Germany's dependence on Russian imported gas for their energy transition. In a more regional perspective, the invasion created obstacles for EU-led initiatives, including the Green Deal, more specifically the Climate Neutrality Clause and the No Net Greenhouse Gas Emissions Goal. Putin, can we hence connect the dots between this energy crisis and security policy? How has Annalena Baerbock's direction towards climate advocacy at the German and EU level changed after the start of the conflict? I think it is very suited to connect the dots with the energy crisis and security policy in this scenario. The EU's dependency on fossil fuels and on Russian gas gave opportunity to Russia to weaponize her gas supply. The quarter of the energy EU uses is natural gas, and the 41% of that gas is imported from Russia. This is a huge amount. So it makes Russia the biggest supplier of the EU. Even without the occurrence of a war, this is a high dependence on Russia and her gas. Therefore, shifting this dependence to renewable energy enables the EU to be energy independent or interdependent to another member state which is a big relief when it comes to energy security. So anything but relying on renewable energy would result in a different type of dependency, either to another country or to fossil fuel supplies. And one of the things that I read while doing my research that impacted me a lot is when you shift to renewable energies, the wind power and the sun power doesn't belong to anyone. So it creates this independence to the country and to its energy security. So because of all of this, not only Burbox, but numerous other parties, especially the EU's approach to climate advocacy when it comes to alternative energy sources has only been prioritized and increased in importance. For Burbox, this only shows how severely we need a radical approach when it comes to climate action and decreasing fossil fuel dependency, even in the face of a challenge. All right, so just one last question here in our Connecting the Dots. So, Puren, you mentioned in your report that part of Birbok's strength in her green transition policy is that she meets the demand of the European energy independence, and due to the current situation, it would also help ultimately shift any remaining dependence from Russia to Ukraine, seeing as Ukraine produces renewable energy. But the war has added, right, a sense of urgency to this proposed solution, even if Germany were to completely switch to renewables right from day to night, they produce significantly less energy than coal and gas can, and are the obvious choice long term, not short term. Thus, we find ourselves with a conflict. So as sustainable as renewable energy is, it does not meet the pre-war demands, energy demands of Germany. So Baerbock has even admitted that this trade-off exists and that the continued use of coal is, and I quote from your report, the price that Germany must pay for the war as the war plays out. So would you say that this situation compromises her climate leadership? How have other members of the Green Party reacted to this scenario? 
I don't believe it is a compromise on our climate leadership, and this is why I identified three central points in our political stance, the third being the importance of recognizing reality. It is a reality that renewable energies are yet to come to a point where they can meet the demand of both Germany and the EU. If anything, I would say it is Baerbock being a climate leader for not denying this factor and pursuing coal exit and receive unrealistic expectations that would mainly hurt the citizens. However, as it must be done, we see Baerbock acknowledging this reality and compromising by extending the coal exit deadline, meanwhile trying to find solutions that can eventually replace the coal power properly. So instead of letting the coal power run as a result of this war, she tries to find solutions that are renewable and can replace coal power, which is why she advocated so much for the offshore wind energy. Although I understand why the question arose, in this situation, the other members of the Green Party, as well as Baerbock, encountered with a choice. Germany was exiting coal and nuclear power simultaneously, and within the bloc, Germany has a considerable role when it comes to supplying energy to the bloc. Prior to Russia's invasion, the EU had asked Germany to continue its nuclear power plant's operation for the sake of Green Deal, which Germany rejected. However, with the current energy crisis, it became a choice between either coal or nuclear exit being pursued as planned. This would have been the part where, at hint sight, I would question Baerbock's climate leadership, as the choice was continuing the coal power, coal power instead of coal. So... This is the only time we see Baerbock and the Green Party putting their values before climate action and they do it without and they don't do it without their own reasoning. As much as nuclear power is a zero emission power force power source, it comes with its controversy and downsides, such as nuclear waste and security risks. So from a climate perspective, continuing nuclear could have been the go to answer. For the Greens and Baerbock as well, nuclear is a non negotiable point. However, from this alone, we cannot say Baerbock's climate leadership is compromised because we don't see her say, okay, we're not compromising nuclear power and we're just going to continue with coal. No, she acknowledges the reality that coal has to go on for the sake of the citizens and with the winter approaching. But as we're letting coal run, we have to find ways to replace the coal power as soon as possible. Okay, so thank you, Putin, for this perspective. Attentive to true analysis, it was just a great answer to finish off our episode for today. So our discussion on Annalena Birbock began by understanding the roots of her political career in the Green Party up to her foreign ministry position, of which she has placed climate policies front and center. Putin helped us link Birbock's upbringing, of which togetherness was required, and how such values are reflected in her political position, one that prioritizes collaboration between several actors, I would say, of the system to implement climate policies. And in order to understand Birbok's political outlook when it comes to climate, it was central to understand her three stakes. The first one being that there's a collective nature of the environmental problem, right? It will reach other spheres of international relations. Second, that there's a need for radical action towards climate change. And third, there's also a need to be realistic about the current scenario. Such stakes are identifiable in her domestic plans for Germany's coal phase-out and regionally in her advocacy of EU's renewable energy search. With regards to a significant moment of which her climate leadership was defined, Putin went into details about how Baerbock's 2018 candidacy speech to become the co-leader of the Green Party set the course for this socio-economic approach to implementing green policies. And with that said, we really saw how important social policy is in accompanying Germany's coal phase-out, which in turn has helped mitigate the impacts of such transition on citizens, I think allowing them to accept the policies in the first place. And with regards to the challenges that Baerbock faces, we discussed the limitations that exist with this simultaneous exit that Germany is attempting from nuclear and coal power, as well as the wider ramifications of the Ukraine-Russian war on Germany and the EU's energy dependence. We have since seen that the war has accelerated Baerbock's domestic plans, yet as being realistic is again one of those three ideological outlooks and stakes that she has, Baerbock has had to adapt her policies to the continuing developments of the conflict. 
Lastly, Putin has pointed towards why, in her opinion, after months of researching Annalena Baerbock, the German leader is a climate leader. All right, so it's been another episode in which Raya Affairs has served as a platform for discussion and for learning. This is all thanks to our star guest, Furin, who has given us straightforward but very in-depth answers as well to all our questions, facilitating our understanding of Annalena Baerbock as a climate leader. So Purin, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been very nice to have a chat with you and talk about these issues. And it has been a great start to my morning as well. <laughs> thank you very much. So for those of you who have also enjoyed our discussion and want to read Purin's report for yourselves, it will be linked in the episode description. But you can also find her research on riagroup.org. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Raya.now, for all the latest updates. It was a pleasure hosting this episode today. We're your co-hosts, Sylvia and Marina. Goodbye from us, and thanks for tuning in. Have a great day in your sphere of influence. <laughs>